Well, let's have a word of prayer, and then we'll, uh, we'll, we'll go through our topic of study today. Father in heaven, I come before you again, and, um, you know, I realize, Father, the solemn and holy responsibility of being at this holy desk, being your mouthpiece. My, my desire, Father, this morning is that you will speak through me. Please hide me. Um, I offer myself to you. I offer no resistance. Please, even though I have prepared this message, if there's something you want me to say, Father, as you told Moses, therefore go, and I will be with thy mouth. I will teach thee what to say. Teach me what I should say this morning, Father. Um, it is my desire that uh, truth will be spoken and that everyone who is here in attendance today, Father, will be blessed through this message. So, Father, uh, please give me courage, give me boldness, uh, take control of my mouth, Father, my mannerisms, tell me how to speak, when to speak, and what to say, and I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So, this message started um, because of a friend of mine, and I was talking to him, and, uh, you know, th thank God for friends, right? And, and I'm not talking about, you know, I'm talking about, Curtis, you, you started off this morning's Sabbath school with saying how memorable meeting everybody was, you know, that, that those things that happened in your life was because people gave themselves, right? Um, you know, th this, this church family, we really learn to trust each other, right, with the hard things in life. You know, Jerry, you, you, you have mentioned many times about Treva being there for you. You guys are there for her. And that's really, the, that's the kind of friendship that I'm talking about. When you can open yourself up and talk to somebody, tell them those hard things, not being afraid of being judged or, or them turning their back on you, right? And, and so this is this kind of friend. And, and I want to tell you his story. He said that when he was growing up, uh, elementary school, his mom and dad split up. Um, now, his, his dad uh, is one of these people that would come and go. And he said, you know, I remember being so excited. He would call early in the week, and he'd be like, hey, son, I'm going to come pick you up this weekend. We're going to spend some time together. We're going to go play ball. We're going to do all these things, right? And he said, I, I tell you what, he said, more often than not, I went to bed heartbroken because not only did he not show up, he didn't even bother to call to say that he wasn't coming. And, um, and so, you know, he said that, that really, that hurt me because I, I was thinking to myself, what have I done? Why doesn't he love me enough to come see me? Why doesn't he want to spend time with me? And, and he said that the times that his dad would go and pick him up, he either dropped him off at his grandfather's house to spend the weekend, and he never saw him all weekend long, or he would take him to the bar where he was drinking, and he'd set him up on a pool table and with quarters, and he would just stay there all night, and his dad would drink and talk to the girls and all this other stuff, right? So, you know, and, and, and he said that, um, you know, what that did for him is it created a lot of deficiencies, right? Because he wanted his dad's attention. He wanted to know that he was loved. He wanted to know that he was accepted. And um, he said what it did is it created abandonment issues. It created self-esteem issues. It led to a life of pleasing people in order to earn love and eventually an attempted suicide. And, um, and this was a very broken man. And uh, if I'm not careful, I'll start crying in front of you all. <laughs> Praise God that he knows the Lord now and his life is changing. But nevertheless, it's a very sad story heartbreaking because there are people just like him out there and um, you know so best thing you can do dads is be there for your kids that's just a side note um, but anyway um, his story touched me and uh, and 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 he told me when he got older that he had an opportunity now he was a teenager he had an opportunity to sit with his dad and his dad said you know 
He said, I want you to know I love you. He said, uh, you know, I just couldn't come see you because I was still very much in love with your mother and it hurt me to see you, but I always had the best of intentions. And, uh, and so <laughs> he, said, uh, he said what he said to his dad. And, um, you know, he said, your best of intentions paved my road to hell. And, uh, you know, that's what the old adage says, doesn't it? The best of intentions is the road to destruction. Um, and so that being said, um, I looked up what does it mean to be intentional? All right. And my desire today is to show you that God is, in fact, intentional, not to the degree of he wants to accomplish something and doesn't accomplish it, but that he does what he sets out to do. OK, so um, there are four different characteristics of being intentional. How many? Four. All right. Very good. So the first one is resolved or determined to do something. All right. Now we think about Daniel, right? In the first chapter of Daniel, uh, it said that Daniel purposed in his heart not to defile himself with the king's meat. He was resolved and he didn't do it. And we know his story. Um, you know, he proposed to the uh, chief of the eunuchs to uh, honor God, and he and his friends came out on top. He was resolved, determined, right? The second one is showing earnest or eager attention, uh, as in, love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, all thy mind, all thy strength, right? Every, you put everything into it, earnest, eager, passionate, right? Um, the third one is the state of mind, with which an act is done, um, as in be not conformed to the image of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. We want to be righteous people, holy people, right? And the fourth one is a clearly formulated plan. So those are the four characteristics of being intentional. Resolved, earnest or eager attention, the state of mind, clearly formulated plan. So let's go to the Bible. Let's see if God fits any or all of these characteristics. All right. So the first one, first verse I have is an old familiar verse. We probably don't need to go there. You can just say it with me. John 316. What does it say? You tell me. Very good. You all passed the test. You get gold stars. I'm very proud of you. Very good. And I'm sure the Lord is pleased. So, you know, Revelation also says that Jesus was the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. God is not a haphazard God. He is not caught by surprise. Before this earth was created, before Adam was created, before the serpent entered, before sin entered the world, God had a plan in place. And that plan included the steps to salvation so that we could be with him again, right? Um, so now you think about Jesus because Jesus is divine, right? Jesus is God. And, and we see in his humanity so this God agreed before the foundation of the world that he would come here and give his life as a sacrifice for us, right? Now, in the garden, remember his experience in the garden? He was down on his knees. He was sweating droplets of blood, realizing what he was about to do. And what was his words? Father, please. If there's any way, take this cup from me. Three times. Three times he asked the Father to, please, if there's another way, I don't want to do this. Right? To the point that he was so agonized that he was sweating blood and his friends were sleeping. Those are not the kind of friends we talked about at the beginning of the message. Be there for your friends when they need you. Um, but anyway... Um, God sent an angel. 
he strengthened Jesus, and Jesus' resolve was, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. You know? Um, so God was determined to do something. He was determined, resolved to provide salvation, and Jesus was resolved to carry out that plan. And he did so, and thank God for that. Give him an amen. amen. All right. So <clears throat> the second one was um, the earnest or eager attention, right? Uh, go to Second Peter chapter 3, verse 9. When you get it, say amen. All right, Second Peter chapter 3, verse 9. Everybody got it? All right. It says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering toward us, were not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God's desire, his earnest desire, is to save, not destroy. Right? Um, in fact, uh, go over to Ezekiel chapter 33. We're going to see this again, we're going to see it a little bit differently. Ezekiel chapter 33, verse 11. Got it? All right. So, it says, Say unto them, if you have King James, read it with me. Say unto them, as I live, saith the Lord God, I have, but that the wicked, mm -hmm. he has what kind of pleasure? No pleasure. I have no pleasure. I mean, can you, can you listen? This isn't in my sermon, but. Isaiah 118, come now, let us reason together, right? Saith the Lord, listen to these words. Turn, turn from your evil ways. Why? Why will you die? Why? You don't have to. I sent my son so you don't have to die. Just turn, please turn. Right? That, that's eager, that's passionate. God wants to save you. He wants to save me. He wants everybody to be saved, right? That's what we saw in 2 Peter 3.9. Not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. It is God's desire for everyone to be saved. Will everyone be saved? Unfortunately not. So we see so far... All right. God was resolved to do something. Did he do that? Okay. Um, earnest and eager attention. What, what is his earnest, eager attention? What did we just talk about? To save. Yes. All right. So the third one, um, the state of mind. Um, let's go over to Revelation chapter 18. Uh, we'll start reading in verse 1. We'll read verses 1, 2, 4, and 5. Well, just 1, 2, and 4. That's what we'll read. All right. If you have King James, you can read with me. After these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit 
and a cage of every unclean and hateful bull bird. Verse 4, And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. So, what state of mind is God in? Saving, Saving right? His wow. desire is to save. His state of mind is to save, right? Is he doing that today, right? We're all sitting here. We're living proof of his desire to save. I know where I was before the Lord. Does it, any of you remember? I like my life a whole lot better now. Mm -hmm. Praise God for that. So that's three out of the four characteristics. I think he's intentional so far, right? All right, so what about the fourth one? Do you think he had a plan? <laughs> what, what was our scripture verse this morning? 1 John chapter 4, verse 9. Go there. Let's read it again. Chapter 4, verse 9. By the way, it, it, is my speed okay? I'm not talking too fast, am I? Okay, all right, just checking. All right, First John chapter 4, verse 9. Everybody got it? All right. In this was manifested the love of God toward us, because God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. That's the plan. Jesus came. He offered his life. And that we could have life through him. It's a very simple plan. Remember, you know, I heard this said one time, and God's just reminding me of it. The plan of salvation has to be simple. It has to be. Because God's desire, how, how many people does God want to be saved? All, right? That includes little children. That includes people that didn't go to Loma Linda or Southern Adventist University or Harvard or Princeton or any one of those Ivy League schools. That includes everybody. So the message has to be simple. It's a very simple message. Turn. Turn. Turn from your evil ways. Follow. That's it. You know, and it all goes back to this first John four nine kind of goes back to for God so loved the world, right? So remember he was resolved to do something, he sent his son. He followed through on that intention, showing us by giving his son and by his death on the cross that he is a God worthy of our trust. Okay? So um now, I have a question for you. I think we've seen that God is intentional, right? Do, do we believe that? Okay. So, does anyone know who Plato is? Who, who's, who's Plato? Okay. Now, I'm not going to give you philosophy. That's not why I'm here. Remember, I want to speak truth. Okay? Um, but I, I want to say something about Plato, and then I'll get to my point. Plato was considered a great thinker. Okay. Now, the reason why is because um, his thinking kind of peeled back layers. What, what he wanted to do was get to the root of anything that he was thinking about. And he considered that the vital part uh, of, of that thought process. Okay. So with that concept in mind, I want to introduce you to a new Hebrew word. The word is hesed. Say it with me, hesed, okay? Now, hesed simply means desire, all right? But it's much deeper than that. So in the Old Testament, hesed is a word that was used over and over again to explain the character of God. So the Hebrews would just say hesed, and that was all-inclusive. Now, I'm going to tell you what that means for us in English, okay? 
here are the characteristics of, of God. Um, faithfulness, mercy, compassion, changelessness, determination, constancy, reliability, commitment, dependability, predictability, trustworthiness, integrity, patience, hope, devotion, passion, long-suffering, justice, truthfulness, goodness, kindness, grace, loyalty, generosity, faith, and I just stopped right there. Okay, so the Hebrews had one word when they said hesed, all of that was encompassed into that one word, right? We have to use a lot of words in order to explain the character of God. Now, the reason I bring that up is because I was reading a book. The book is called A God Named Desire, and I want to read to you what the author wrote about this word hesed. It's, it's very good. And, and I quote, he says, In that epic divine human encounter, a massive paradigm shift, that means you're the way that you think, right? A massive paradigm shift was to be set in motion as Jesus Christ would come to our world as the hesed of God incarnate. Here was a God who was communicating to humanity, making promises, seeking covenant relationship, vowing himself to be just and true in all his ways, promising to create the same kind of character in all who would open their hearts to him. More than that, here was a God who was promising to one day show up in the flesh to act out his faithful love to the point of giving his life for the world. This God would give himself as the sacrifice for human salvation rather than requiring that sacrifice be offered to him. He goes on to say, Hesed is the biblical word for God's devotion to us at any cost to himself. Jesus Christ is divine, right? We started with that earlier. Jesus Christ is God. God left heaven. Who was it that hung on that cross? God. God hung on that cross for you and for me. Because his desire is to save at any cost to himself. Okay? I think we can say without any shadow of a doubt that God is intentional, right? But wouldn't you know it? God has an enemy, and that enemy is also intentional. So let's look at some of these. Um, let's start with the first one, what, resolve, right? Go to Revelation 12. Revelation 12, what verse are we going to read? You tell me. Does anybody know? 17. Revelation chapter 12, verse 17. You got it? All right. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So what is he resolved to do? Make war. That's right. So he definitely has a purpose. And who is he making war against, according to that verse? Do, do, does he care about the Sunday keepers that are, you know, no? Who, who's he after? Annie? Mm-hmm. Uh, say that again. He said that I will put enmity between thy seed and hers. What that mean? Hatred. Okay. So, so. 
So, so light and dark are as opposite as opposites can get, right? So if we take that, right, God is a God of righteousness, right? So righteousness, light, um, holy living, that all is over here, right? Then you have darkness, which is sin and death, right? The two cannot coexist. So remember Jesus said either you love the one and hate the other, or you hate the one and love the other. That's enmity. That there is no, well, you know, it, it, it's okay. I mean, it's okay for you. It's just not for me. That, that, that's not it. You know, you take your stand. It's either this or that. There's no in between. Right. Amen. Thank you. You're welcome. Mm, well, we'll get there. Remember, there's three other <laughs> characteristics that we got to get through. So, yeah. All right. So the earnest or eager attention, right? So, so Satan definitely has a plan. His plan is to go to war. All right. So let's go to First Peter. First Peter 5 verse 8, right after Hebrews. So this is something that we should memorize and we should understand. When you get there, say amen. amen. All right. So it says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Look, Satan does not rest, y'all. We go to bed. Five, six, seven, eight, nine hours a night. Satan ain't resting. No. You know, when you're going to work, he's not at rest. When you're at home with your family, he's not at rest. When you're in church, he's not at rest. If it weren't for the protection of the angels, he would be up in here right now. That's the enemy. And remember, um, in Job uh, chapter 1, it says that uh, there was a day that the sons of God came together um, and Satan was also among them. And, uh, and the Lord said, from whence comest thou? And he said, from walking to and fro in the earth and walking up and down in it, right? And, uh, and then the Lord said, have you considered my servant Job? So Satan is always looking for someone to tempt right? Peter is telling us, be what? Sober, be vigilant, right? So we have to be on our guard. We have to keep our minds clear. We have to know what's going on. We are at war, all right? And the only way that we can win that war is through Jesus Christ. We don't have the power on our own. So, all right. Um, so as he's looking for someone to tempt, or as we read earlier, to devour is what the, the Bible says. What state of mind is he going to come to us in? So now, I know we've talked about this a few times in Sabbath school. Let's go all the way back to the beginning, because that's the place to start, isn't it? And Annie, you were kind of leading us there. Genesis chapter 3. Thank you, Lord. Mm-hmm. All right. And all we need is verse 1. Now, the serpent was more what? Subtle. Or in other word, give me another word for subtle. Cunning. Cunning. What's another word? Deceitful. Deceitful. What's another word? Blessed. Crafty. Sneaky. 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 Mm-hmm. Yes. All right. So we, we understand, right? So the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, listen to this, listen to how subtle he is, right? Hath God said, ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Now, now, I mean, like, come on, think about this. 
Let, let's put this in our language. Did God really say you can't eat of any tree in the garden? And, and Eve's like, what? That's, that's crazy. No, of course we can eat from the trees of the garden. He just told us not to eat that one. But, but this is how he comes, right? Subtle, crafty, you know? And, uh, and so that's how he's coming to us. That's why we need to be sober and vigilant. Now, let's look at the last one. Actually, before we do that, um, let's see from the Bible, or do we need to go there? Um, who is the serpent ultimately? Satan, Satan. yes. So Revelation 12, verse 9. Just go there real quick. We'll just, we'll just bet. Sometimes repetition deepens the understanding or the impression. So Satan has a few names, actually. Lucifer is not one of them anymore. He is no longer bringing light. All right, Revelation 12, 9 says, The great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. His number one tactic is deception. All right? So, we have to understand. Um, where am I at in here? I was, I was going over this. this I apologize, because as I was going over the sermon this morning, the Lord was giving me more stuff, and I have it handwritten in here, so I want to make sure I don't miss anything. <laughs> but, um, you know, Satan is crafty. He's cunning. And we have to... I want to. I want you guys to get this point. We have to fortify our minds with the Word of God. Okay, like we talked about earlier, don't be conformed to the image of this world, but be transformed. How? The renewing of the mind. Right. So when sin entered the world, what we got was a mind that was no longer in favor of holy living. That's kind of foreign to us now. So we have to learn to be that way. And praise God that he's merciful and he's patient and he's long-suffering. And his desire is to save because he allows us opportunity after opportunity after opportunity to turn. Right? Can we get an amen for a good God? Mm -hmm. So the devil's intent is to cast doubt on the word of God. That's what he wants to do. That's why we have to know what the scriptures say for ourselves. So now Jesus even told us, um, go to 2 Corinthians 11, 14, and 15. What's my time? All right. Second Corinthians. Bless you. Second Corinthians chapter 11, and we read 14 and 15. Now, who wrote Corinthians? Paul. Very good. So Paul says to us, no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it's no great thing if his ministers, those other angels that were cast out of heaven with him, are also transformed as ministers of righteousness whose end shall be according to their works, right? So go over to, let's see this again, Mark chapter 13. Mark 13, verse 22. Now, in my Bible, these words are in red, which means Jesus is telling us something. So let's pay attention to what Jesus is telling us, okay? Verse 22, false Christs and false prophets shall rise and shall show signs and wonders to seduce. What's, those, what, what's that next word? Yeah. If. Yeah. If. What, what does that word if tell us? What does that mean? It's a possibility. 
we have a choice. But it doesn't have to be the case, right? If it were possible, even the elect, right? Now go over to uh, Matthew, Matthew chapter 24. Jesus is still talking, pretty much saying the same thing, but this is Matthew's account of it. For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch. Now, now that's a different word. Insomuch. What does insomuch mean? Like, to the degree. Right? And, um... So in so much that if, there it is again, if it were possible, they should deceive even the very elect. Okay? If it were possible. Which means it's not possible. There's a way to not be deceived. All right? Um, so the question is, the, the last one is the clearly formulated plan, right? What is Satan's plan? Check this out. I, I love God because God does not leave us to fend for ourselves, does he? He always prepares us. He likes us to be informed. He likes us to know what's going on. All right. So go over to um, Isaiah chapter 14. And we'll see why Satan is doing all this. Isaiah 14 verses 13 and 14. And these are probably familiar verses. So th this is God speaking of Satan. And uh, starting in verse 13, he says, For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. So apparently, um, Curtis, you're in the doctorate field. Do you know any good optometrists for old Satan? He had an eye problem. And... Uh, now, seriously, though, um, you know, Satan's desire is for our worship. God's desire is for our worship. God is intentional about gaining our worship. Satan is intentional about gaining our worship. Right? And we've seen that from the Bible. So what makes the difference? Hmm? Matt, you said it earlier. It's choice. God has given us free will, right? So why I have taken this time to explain all this to you is because I want you to understand that you have a choice, okay? It doesn't matter, like my friend, you know, the fact that nobody in his family was a Christian, the fact that what his dad did to him, the fact that he had an attempted suicide, he still found that, well, the Lord found him. He didn't find the Lord. You know, we love God because he first loved us. So praise God for that, right? So you don't have to stay where you are. Circumstances, your circumstances in life don't mean you have to stay there. You know, God desires to change and transform our lives. He desires to have us as part of his eternal kingdom. Now, I know I want to be there. Anybody else? Amen. Right? All right. So... Zig Ziglar, motivational speaker, said, this is very profound, but very simple. Every choice you make has a result. Okay? Now, somebody else put it this way. You are free to make whatever choice you want, but you are not free from the consequences of that choice. Anybody ever made a bad decision? I know I have. It was the consequences of that decision that told me it was a bad decision. I thought it was a good decision at the time. That's why I made it, right? But very simply, good choices have good consequences. Bad choices have bad consequences, right? So think about Adam. Adam was created perfect. 
He was taught by Jesus himself. He had the fellowship of the angels. He had dominion over this world. And um, until he made that faithful choice to disobey, right? Ultimately, he was disobeying the voice of God, right? So let's go to Genesis chapter 2, because I want you guys to see this, right? When you finally get this, like, I remember, like, I had heard these verses so much, and one day it just clicked, and the light bulb went on, right? So Genesis 2. Verses 16 and 17. This is the beginning. This is where it all is. Everybody got it? The Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof, Thou shalt what? Surely die. Surely die. Anybody ever seen a graveyard? God's word is true. Just look at that graveyard. So I can imagine, right? And, and, and I hope I speak truth when I say this. I, I heard this one time. You can almost hear a side conversation, right? Here's God and Adam who had face-to-face -face fellowship that we don't have right now. We have that by faith through Jesus Christ. But here's God and Adam talking. Adam, look around you. Look at the, the sky and the birds. You like those? Yes, Father, I like those. How about the, uh, the trees, the food? Is the food good? Do you like the food? Oh, yes, Father, the food's very tasty. Thank you very much. How about that lady over there? You like that lady I created for you? Oh, yes, sir, she is... Mm, very nice, thank you. Quite a companion and a helper. I really appreciate that, Father. Well, good. Do you want to continue to stay like this? Are you happy? Yes, I'm happy. Very happy. Then, then listen to me, okay? I've given you everything. I've given you dominion. You have companionship. You have fellowship. You have me. You have all that you need. Just leave that tree alone. Don't touch it. Don't eat of it. That's all I ask. That's it. That's it. That's all I ask. And you can remain here forever. Yes. Just imagine that. And God wants us to get back to that point. So he can have face-to-face -face fellowship with us, right? So it all comes down to a choice, right? Think about Joshua. Joshua chapter 24. In fact, we can even go there. Let's just read it together. You can't lose by reading the word of God. And we'll be closing on this. Joshua chapter 24. Get there, get there. All right. All right. Verses 14 and 15. Now, therefore, fear the Lord. Serve him in sincerity and in truth. Put away the gods which your father served on the other side of the flood and in Egypt, and serve ye the Lord. If it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites, in whose land ye dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Now, I'll bring something out. Joshua said, as for me and my house, right? Now, Joshua was making a distinction. I hope that my family, like me, is going to serve the Lord. But Joshua is saying, even if they don't, I will be faithful, right? In that day, we all must stand individually before the Lord, and we must give an account. And the only right answer is, I gave my life to Jesus Christ, and my sins are forgiven, and I have a relationship with him. Right? So, if the rest of your family decides that they want to go to church on a Sunday, is that what God said? No. As for me, 
I'm going to church on Saturday because that's God's holy day. That's what the Bible says, right? And, um, you know, whatever it is, I mean, you fill in the blank. No one, nothing is worth losing eternity over. So um, I hope today we've learned that God is intentional, Satan is intentional, and we, if we want to be part of that eternal kingdom, must be intentional about the way that we live our lives. Closing scripture, 1 Corinthians 10, 13. You don't have to go there, just listen. Whether therefore ye eat or ye drink, or whatsoever ye do, do how? All to the glory of God. Okay? That's our mindset. That must be our resolve, our desire. You know, Jesus said, um, I do always those things that please him. That's why he and his father were one. Always. That's the way we have to be. Is there anyone, here, here, here's the appeal today, is there anyone that would like to say, Father, I want to be resolved to follow you? If so, raise your hand. I just want to say a prayer for you. Well, Father, you see the hands that have gone up. You know uh, the desires that are in their heart, Father. And so for everyone who has raised a hand, I want to pray for them specifically. We now know that Satan is at war. He is vigilant. But praise God that he's a created being and that Jesus Christ is more powerful than he. And so, Father, through Jesus, by your spirit, please give us the strength to not be deceived, to overcome our sins, to not let anything stand in the way of our eternal salvation. Father, please watch over us. Please protect us. Please help us to continue to learn and grow and mature in, um, in spiritual things. Help us to love one another, to be there for each other um, when, when they need us. And Father, as we go from this place, uh, I hope this message will stick with everybody, Father, and that we will make a choice every day to be intentional about our spirituality. And uh, I ask these things, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen.